教育与女性领导力。有请对话嘉宾 GSB Accelerant TE Fund 董事总经理德波拉·维索女士，以及小说作者、经济研究员陶景涛博士。掌声有请。Please welcome Ms. Deborah Pozo, Managing Director of TSB Accelerant TE Fund, and Dr. Hao Jingfang, Fiction Writer and Economic Researcher.
deliver education to places that have not historically been able to access great education. Do you, you know, harking back to perhaps some optimism about um, about the opportunities for the future, do you think the role of technology in delivering education more broadly to wider parts of the population, not not just here but in China and all over the world, do you think that's a, an optimistic thing and do you believe that we can kind of educate our way around some of these the job obsolescence that you're that you're talking about? I'm optimistic in one way, but I still have a lot of worries on the other side. Uh, I'm optimistic because I really see a lot of uh, uh, positive progresses these years. Uh, in the rural areas in China, we see that uh, they now uh, some of them have the access to computers and mobile phones, and they can have those um, online classes uh, to get in touch with the big city teachers. And these uh, projects already have some impact there. And uh, uh, I think that in the future, these more and more lectures and materials can can help the uh, children in the poor areas. However, the big, there is still the big obstacle that uh, uh, for a lot of students there, they lack the motivation for study. So they might not use the technology to help their study. They, some of, a lot of those students get involved into the online games yeah. and also some other not so healthy materials. So uh, the, the technology, the, the equipment, and uh, the network, they can bring the valuable uh, study materials as well as all the other things. Then it, it becomes a big question for the students uh, how to choose, what to choose on the internet. Uh, in, in big cities, the, the young students, they have the important persons to help them, their parents, their teachers, to guide them in, to, to this technology. But in those poor areas, these students, uh, sometimes they do not have parents at home, and sometimes their teachers are not so, uh, uh, do not, are, are not so responsible for, for their studies. And then, uh, also, the teachers face the problem that they cannot use the equipment properly. Some of those teachers reported that they do not know how to use these computers, where to find those uh, uh, valuable materials. Then I think that uh, uh, the, the only condition that this technology can have effect is that they can be used by some people, by proper people properly. So I, I hope that in the future we give more and more help to the parents and teachers there in those prop, in those rural areas, and then they can help the children to use this technology to help their study instead of uh, letting them get into the computer games too early to ruin their studies. So now we, uh, I myself, conduct a small group. We do experiments in the rural kindergartens. We give the teachers trainings and the technology <laughs> support to the teachers. And then the teachers can have some lectures online. Uh, the teachers can have some materials. Uh, and uh, we have the online uh, connections with the teachers. And then the teachers in the kindergarten can deliver better uh, education, better lectures to the children there. So we do hope that the technology has the uh, human uh, temperature, the human kindness around it. And then, uh, only then it can guarantee the effect effectiveness of the technology. Okay, let's, let's step back and talk a little bit about gender and being a mom. Um, I'm just curious, a couple things. One, you are world famous as a writer and um, a leader in the science fiction category. Category, And I'm just curious, one, how being a mom has kind of colored your professional perspective, both as a writer as, and as an academic and ec an economist. Um, and I'm also curious how you feel about being a role model for working mothers here in China, um, what that means to you and, and, and how you sort of move forward in that capacity. Being a mother uh, significantly affect my job. Uh, after becoming a mother, I got a lot of passionate uh, 
on these educational programs, and I feel more sympathy to those uh, poor children in the poor areas. Uh, before being a mother, perhaps I just uh, rationally think that, oh, this is a problem. But after being a mother, whenever I see some children in the poor areas uh, uh, eager, uh, just uh, really hope, hope for some good uh, materials, but uh, they really lack of uh, those things, I, I feel really sympathy of them. I do hope to do something for them. So that passion is coming from the, the role of a mother. And so now I started my own educational program at uh, Tongxing School. And the motivation for this is uh, that I am a mother. I hope to bring a good education to every children in this country. We have the, um, the opinion of a shared education. We hope that education can be a real shared economy in the future. And uh, being a mother, let me think of the uh, relationship between uh, an adult and a kid. Uh, before that, I think that an um, educational perhaps is uh, a, a leading leader. Uh, we, we led the children to the future. But now, I think that uh, an adult is more like a, a companion for the kids. I do not push my children. I do not. Uh, Leave my children. I just uh, uh, stand by her and him, uh, and I just watch them. I help them. I give them support, but they let their own lives. So I am not very uh, anxious of education of my own kids. I do believe that they can find their own way. I just need to stand there and accompany them for their life. So, and then I think that uh, being a mother, I need to have my own proper life. I need to pursue my own dream instead of them, theirs. So I still do my work, I'm quite busy, and I have my own life. And I, can, I, I think that uh, uh, from my life, they can know what they would like to pursue in the future. And now I am doing this uh, Tongxing uh, school project, and my children, they are also the... Can you talk a little bit more about your project, this new initiative around education that you're doing? Yeah, yeah we, we do this uh, Tongxing school. We hope it to be a shared uh, education program. We, ha we have a, a online courses, as well as uh, um, the, the normal offline courses. And we, uh, these courses are commercial. We uh, have money f from the big city uh, families. But we give free lectures and free uh, programs for the children in the usual area. So we hope that uh, this can be a balance. And so almost a move for K-12 in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, four years old to 12 years old. And, and then uh, we hope that uh, uh, it's a social enterprise. The more we get our uh, commercial programs, the more we can deliver to the poor children in the rural areas. And now we give general education to children, mostly science and uh, humanity and art and other things that are not taught in the primary school in China. Uh, in China, most schools are still focusing on uh, Chinese, English, and math. But uh, for the young kids, especially the kids in the poor families. They do not have access to the uh, good uh, uh, resources of science and art and uh, history and all these other things. But we think that the knowledge in these fields are very important for the future when they grow up. So we give quite uh, 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 free lectures to the poor children on this and uh, also give uh, normal lectures to the other kids. We hope to just broaden their uh, perspective to the future and also to gain creativity in the future. Well, that's interesting because I, I, it's interesting with your background. Obviously, on the one hand, you're very technical, right? You're an economist, you're an academic. Um, at the same time, you're deeply creative. And in the United States, we have a big you know, discussion going on around the importance of you know, creative learning and, and, and concerns about the emphasis on coding and STEM classes being almost overemphasized at the expense of creativity and what that could mean for children going forward if we are you know, completely balanced, you know, balanced towards the STEM and coding kind of activities. What, what's your, your thought there in terms of that balance? 
I think that uh, programming uh, is, is important. However, uh, we do not need to let the children to start that early, like four or five years old. Uh, because I think that programming is a natural result after you have some basics, mathematics and science and other things. So I think for the children, the most important thing is to help them to promote their uh, curiosity and uh, their exploration of this world. The more they understand the basic principles of the world, the more creat creativity they can get in the future. And actually the most important thing is the habit of questioning. When you uh, when you used to just question the world, why is it? Is it true? What's the fact? And when you have this kind of uh, capability, you will be pretty creative in all your life because you have a lot of questions in the world, and every question can direct into a new uh, event, new uh, invention, or new discovery. So. We, uh, in our educational program, we just let the children to pro to, to help them to ask good questions and to reason, uh, to uh, think of this world, and to reason, to just uh, um, uh, develop some good thinking method. And I think that uh, if you have this kind of uh, thinking habit, and and you keep that habit uh, into the adult. And then you can uh, just uh, create more and more uh, things because all the um, creative, creative discoveries and inventions are just the fruit of uh, some deep uh, questioning and exploration of the world. So I think that uh, when the young children they get the trainings in mathematics, in science, and in uh, the art, creative, creative art. And then after that, so they, they have some uh, skillful trainings in programming and more technical things uh, will be a natural result. I, I don't think that they should start from zero or four years, so that's too early. Okay. Good. Well, my, my starting later. But um, I just want to ask a little bit. I first learned about you in reading AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee. And um, you were you and Folding Beijing were repeatedly mentioned um, throughout the book, which uh, had to have been kind of an exciting, expanding your exposure even further. So um, I'm curious really about two things. He spends a little bit of time in the book um, around the impact of artificial intelligence on the delivery of education. Um, it, it, we actually are seeing some very exciting things we believe happening there in terms of accelerating or in personalizing learning. Um, I'm curious really on two, two fronts. One, just have the impact of the exposure you've gotten from, uh, the sort of double exposure you've gotten from, from AI superpowers having become such an extraordinary global hit. Um, and then also any, any thinking you have about the, the positive um, impact that AI can have on the delivery of education, not in, really across the swath from, from low income kids all the way up to, to higher income students. Um, so just, just curious for your thoughts there. Yeah, for the exposure of the story, um, it helps me to start my <laughs> educational program because when we, when I design this program, when we deliver this educational program, we have the uh, principle that we hope to uh, just promote some good capability that the children to adapt in the future. So we, we help the students to develop creativity, uh, critical thinking, and uh, other communication and other skills. We, we hope that this, this uh, educational program can really help them to ad adapt the um, AI uh, era in the future. So this exposure of uh, in Beijing uh, helped me to just uh, deliver my educational uh, opinions to, to the to normal uh, or normal audience, uh, and also for the uh, positive side of artificial intelligence, I, I think that uh, it is possible for some artificial teacher artificial intelligence teachers in the future. Perhaps uh, uh, some programs, some uh, educational lectures can be automatically responsive to the children. They, they can give the children some advices of uh, uh, their uh, study, uh, their results. They can 
we will take the children ask questions. Maybe the, they can automatically give some answers. If uh, that kind of personalized study can be uh, realized, then for some poor children in the rural areas where the good teachers are lacking, then the, the uh, students might uh, get advices and can study from artificial intelligence teacher. That will be quite ideal in the future. But so we are still uh, way behind, uh, way uh, from that yet too early. So I'm just curious on the topic of sort of women in the workforce, and as I'm sure um, you follow, uh, in the United States we've had a very widely publicized and now long-lasting hashtag MeToo movement. Um, hoping that that has some positive impacts around um, gender parity and female leadership uh, in corporations and, and across the workforce. Just curious again, if the, the position that you've got and the, the sort of the leverage and the, and the um, influence you have in this regard as a prominent working woman, what's your what's your view of the, the landscape of working women here in China today, and, and the role you can play in, in continuing to push forward for all those types of issues? I, I think that in China, uh, perhaps we have the highest uh, one of the highest rates of. Uh, uh, or women workforce uh, participation rate. Yeah, uh, one reason is because uh, uh, we we do have that kind of revolutionary era era in, in the past. And another reason is the economic pressure is still high for Chinese families. So we do have, face have a lot of women workforce in, in China. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, there is still the true imbalance uh, for men and women yeah, in, in the workplace. Uh, but we can see now more and more Chinese women entrepreneurs, more and more uh, China, women leaders now. I, I hope that these women entrepreneurs, these women leaders, can create better atmosphere for women workers and to, to create new standards for corporate uh, uh, management, uh, new um, atmosphere for the recruitment for the women workforce. And the more uh, women le take the leadership in the society, the better uh, environment for the women uh, workers in the future. I do hope so. Yes, I, I agree. <laughs> I'm with you there. Um, finally, I'd like to, to really kind of come back to your, um, to your literary uh, career. And um, I'm just curious if you can give us a little look um, what's next on the on the fold? Is there will there be more any further um, renditions of or further versions of the fold in Beijing? Uh, subsequent stories of the fold in Beijing, and, and where is the um, the movie? I know there was a movie in the works, and where does that where does that all sit with uh, uh, the movie? Yeah, the movie is uh, uh, still being adapted now. I assigned it to a. a Direct director called Josh Kim, and he's still uh, adapting the script now. I hope that uh, it can be, it can uh, be uh, just make get into the next stage in the next year. But I'm not sure about <laughs> about have, this. Have you been part of that? Have you been active? Uh, I I gave him some advices, and I read his uh, script. He's really a nice director, and he did a lot of. Uh, uh, preparing works. I trust him okay. yeah, a lot. And also, I myself may, may participate in a um, TV series, yeah, on online series. Uh, it's yeah, it's a, it's a program. And in that uh, series, I also deliver another story based on the setting of uh, For the Regime. That is a completely new story. We, we call that project uh, The Dust of Future. Uh, we, we hope to make a series of stories on, online, uh, but that project is also quite in the in the early stage. But I will give my uh, new story on this. But I'm not uh, writing the Fourteen Beijing novel now. I'm working on something else. I'm writing on another new long novel now. So is that? Are you? Give me a little context on how you arrived at the science, because you began writing very young. I mean, you were a teenager when you first published, you were first widely published. When I was uh, 
was uh, in the middle school, I tried to write, write some stories, but uh, it's only like a, a, a class, classroom uh, attempt, not very serious, and I did not try to publish them. Uh, just uh, it just get around around my friends. Uh, I first published my uh, full length novel was when I was in my senior year in the, uh, in, in university. So that that was uh, 2006. And it's 12 years now. And has science fiction always been kind of what you wanted to focus on? And how did you how did you arrive at that genre? Is kind of what your voice was? Is, will you stay there, or is your next novel going to be outside the science fiction category? Actually, I've already uh, written something out of the science fiction genre. Uh, I wrote a full-length novel called Born in 1984. That was a realistic novel uh, focusing on the uh, reform and opening up process in China and the, the growth of the young adults. So, uh, and also I've, wrote, I've written some realistic short stories already. But I, I like the genre of science fiction because it gives you imagination uh, space. It, it, it lets you to just, uh, uh, ch you can change the world, you can change the things in the society, you, you can make uh, comedies and to, to just uh, let the world upside down and so you, you can have a lot of freedom. That's the uh, fascinating part of science fiction. But I also enjoy writing some realistic stories to just reflect the reality around me. That's great. So is your longer, is the, is the novel you're working on now, will that be science fiction or reading? It's science fiction. It's uh, it happening in the future uh, when the war, when there's war time in the future. So. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> or going back to not being optimistic. <laughs> That's good. So has, has your continued do you view the work you've done around artificial intelligence and the work you're doing in your fiction? I mean, is that does that come in parallel? I mean, you get learnings out of your 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 you know, nonfiction your day your day job on the nonfiction side. Work that back into your writing. Yes, uh, last year actually I published a book, a collection of stories called uh, "The GPI, the Mirror of Men." In that book, I uh, contain six stories on artificial intelligence and two and other articles. All the book is about artificial intelligence. And I used the, some of those knowledge I gained from a, a recent project into that uh, science fiction uh, writing. Because I think that the more you understand technology, the more you understand the society, uh, the more ideas you can get into your story writing. Because I think that science fiction uh, stories, the ideas are not coming from nowhere. You have to uh, have some knowledge, and then you have some questions, you have some think thinkings, and even debates with others. And then you got your ideas for a story. So I always think that my daytime jobs and my uh, part-time writing, they, they help each other. And even now when I do my uh, educational project for the children, I sometimes got ideas from children. I think that they are amazing, they are fascinating. I always can have some new ideas uh, that can help me to get into the writings in the future. Well, you're a marvel. I don't know when you sleep. Uh. <laughs> right, yeah, I sleep quite less. So you do not sleep much, as far as I've been able to read. You, uh, you apparently write from five. Five in the morning to seven in the morning, and um, so you get by on very little sleep. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a bad. That's your trick. Well, um, I want to thank you. This has been fantastic. You are remarkable, and um, I, I, I had to work hard to get uh, folding Beijing in English. So I hope everything, all of your stories are easily available in English for, for everyone to uh, to enjoy because the translations are thank um, you. spectacular. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much.